Okay, today we're going to be going over a review of a 200 No Limit session I recently played, and hopefully we can get into some interesting and informative spots. Not going to mince words, uh, 200 No Limit is quite, quite soft, as you can see across a lot of these tables. We see that the opponents are not full stacked, opening to ridiculous sizings, so hopefully we're going to get into a lot of juicy, juicy spots. Here on the button, I'm going to open up 5-6, super standard. Going to likely call a 3-bet in this rake structure, If even though if we were playing like 50 to a little bit or something, probably give up. The small blind calls me, which is an indication that he's probably on the weaker end of things with a gut shot plus backdoor hearts. Going to start with a bet and facing a check raise. This hand is going to be an instantaneous call. Always going to call with my gut shots. Going to call with hands with double back doors like... Jack of hearts, clubs, and diamonds, and usually going to be able to find mostly folds with spades. Uh, the little check raises flop, and on this turn, you know, it's not a uh, horrible to raise here on this turn because villain really now only has exactly like pocket twos or, or something like ace queen. On uh, the second table here, I defend uh, queen jack suited to a very very small sizing. It's quite close. Uh, when Villa checks to me on the river, I just go for it here. Uh, I mean, obviously I run into, like, pocket threes or pocket twos once in a while, but Villain really can't have queens. Um, if Villain did check-raise me with ace-queen, now I'm going to be putting him into a horrible spot. There's backdoor hearts that missed, and I hold hearts. So, you know, uh, go for the large sizing. When we look at Pile Solver, it says generally likes jamming there, although exactly my combination of hands can go for a slightly smaller sizing. Table one, obviously gonna find a fold with my offsuit hands. And uh, I would generally fold, I mean, basically all of my offsuit hands except for Ace Queen, which is probably gonna be a four bet, eh, like 25 to 40% of the time. On table two, defend Ace-9, very, very standard, going to be calling a bet of any size here. Uh, this is going to be a board where a villain can occasionally uh, put in some, like, large bet sizes as well. You know, if it's, like, Jack-3-5, he can actually start with some over bets here. So, villain starts with a two-thirds pot size bet, or 60%, obviously going to make the call. Uh, and going to call the turn as well, and then kind of evaluate by the river. I uh, really like to see that my opponent bets small. It is very often a tell when your opponents bet on the smaller end that they're not going to fire through on the river. Uh, so my hand is easily going to be able to check uh, and, and expect to see a lot of checks on the river. On table one, facing a min raise, obviously just going to put in jacks. I don't know what the you know exact stack off uh, requirements here. 70 big blinds with jacks, out of position to a weaker player who min raises me. I guess I fall for the trap there, but definitely, you know, happy to just put my hand in for not too much money. On table one, queen jack, I'm sorry, table two, queen jack offsuit is a little bit thin. Uh, definitely going to be a you know, profitable open when there are weaker players at the table, and I think everyone at these tables are relatively weak. Again, you know, there's a 90 big blind stack. Um, you know, everyone's opening really, really large, and so even though I don't have a HUD, you, I just get a general sense that everyone's pretty bad. On table one, uh, I, I pause a little bit, but I probably should just be open folding this hand uh, when there's not smaller stacks on the table or not obviously weaker players. Just going to be, you know, folding my suited connectors from earlier positions. Aces, obviously going to be a raise here. Hopefully we get some smoke. Do you have some smoke for me? Yes. Nice polarized smoke. Uh, here with aces, the correct sizing, small blind versus big blind, is going to be um, this smaller sizing. Villain calls me really, really fast. Usually tells me he has kind of a medium strength hand, so I start with a very, very small bet on the flop. Hopefully we can get some action. Yes. Puts in the raise. Nothing I can really do except just call. Obviously, sometimes I'd let off some kind of free cards here, but it's also possible that Villain will just jam some of his best draws here. Uh, and now when the turn is, you know, it, it's actually kind of pretty mediocre because some of the draws got there. If Villain somehow had 7-6, which is a hand that he would call pre-flop, unfortunately he gets there. On the double-suited board, he really only wants to use the all-in sizing, and uh, fortunately we just cooler him. Uh, very, you know, very standardly played from, from Villain. Here on table 2, we raise it up with 5-10, obviously going to find a fold. Going to raise it up with 5-3, and basically just keep my foot on the gas until my opponent's tell me I have a reason otherwise. 
when I see that a lot of opponents are raising 3x, 3.5x, you know, when I see a guy call a 3.5x with a 1200 stack, I generally think he's a weaker player. And so, because of this, I should probably err on being a little too aggressive pre-flop, because I mostly can, you know, uh, push my post-flop edge. Uh, on table one, it's pretty close between betting or checking here. Uh, you can play a mixed strategy, you can play large, better check. Uh, I think about... <laughs> I think about betting large, but I, I just ended up checking here, even though, you know, this is going to be definitely a minority play. Uh, and on table two, put a squeeze. I, I would probably prefer if I made the squeeze a little bit larger, but, you know, this is going to be totally fine. Here, I'm going to probably want to bet a sizing that commits against the weaker, uh, you know, uh, against the smaller stack, but, you know, a sizing that does not commit me for the full hundred. I think if, you know, I, I bet this, one guy calls and then the hundred big blind guy squeezes us all in, this is gonna be a spot where he's gonna have more tens, fives, and twos. So really, I'm just hoping he folds here and then obviously I'm gonna snap it off the queens and villain has five, seven. So as you can see, online poker is healthy and well. Here uh, with Jax, uh, at, uh, at depth, just gonna call Jax. I think if I four bet and put the money in, I'm not going to be thrilled. And on table one, I start with a check. Obviously, you know, you can just bet here, but kind of going for a little bit of a trap. Uh, Villain ends up betting here. Jax uh, should be pretty close. Um, you know, if I just check raise and just put the money in, Villain's going to obviously show me some ace, queen, pocket kings, um, stuff like that. Uh, so, you know, going to have to have some kind of hands that go check, call, check, call, check, call. Turn is a jack, so I end up leading because I think that, you know, Villain's three bet under the gun plus one range is not going to be very jack heavy. Sometimes he folds jack 10 or queen jack pre. And so I think that I have the jack advantage. Start by betting small, he calls, and now over bet the river to kind of push my advantage here. Uh, and that's, you know, very, very standard. Solver approved. Easy game. Villain ends up having ace queen. So he had a straight, a little bit of, uh, a little bit fortunate that I don't check raise on the flop. Otherwise I would get into a ton of trouble. So uh, that ends up working out for us. Here on table one, I'm going to start with a polarized bet on this flop, uh, especially because I block a lot of my opponent's double back doors with, uh, you know, with two, the matching suits and the nines. going to often want to bet because it's going to push my opponents towards a made hand very often when he bets. When villain checks the river, uh, after donking the turn some, somehow, I have to think that my hand is, is good here. So I end up betting, and Villain puts in a check raise. You know, when Villain check call donks and then check raises river, I just assume he's a weaker player. And when players are weak, you know, I don't really need to bluff catch here. Uh, Ten two is quite close facing a min raise. I'm guessing, you know, I think about three betting because obviously this is going to be close to the bottom of my suited range. But facing a min raise, I I'm guessing that like nine two, you know, uh, like other uh, you know other cards are going to be a little bit better there. I imagine villain is going to raise. My, my hand's just going to call. Can occasionally three bet, but generally a lot of these suited medium cards are just going to call, and I'm going to three bet, you know, the very high end and low end of my range. Facing a very small bet on a flop where villain's not going to have too many advantages, I'm going to start out with a, a raise with my, you know, my very good back doors and queen high. Uh, turn bricks for me. I do improve to a gut shot, but. When my diamonds don't go in, this is a hand that really wants to check because now I'm blocking a lot of my opponent's backdoor diamonds, particularly this hand blocks a bajillion backdoors. Uh, and when river is a blank, this hand actually should just give up. If I want to fire, I want to fire something like hearts, right? Um, and I just I think that from a you know GTO perspective, very often when you like overbet the flop, raise a bunch of flops, and it comes like running blanks, those are going to be some of the spots where theoretically you should be able to give up the most. So I give up there, and uh, villain shows. Be jacks, so let's be very results oriented and say that was a genius play. But definitely gonna raise the flop, especially when, you know, villain should not be betting too much on those seven, eight high flops. I think, you know, from a simplification perspective, you can just check his entire range. And when he does bet, it should be just, you know, a very, very rare amount of the time. I think that jacks should, jacks should generally start by check calling or check raising the flop there. Here, you're gonna raise king nine suited, immediately called, get called by both players. So I'm gonna think that both players are, you know, <laughs> probably a little bit on the weaker side. One player because he called from the small blind, the other player because he has a deep stack. And very often I've found, and this is something that me and my friends 
uh, have noticed is that when players um, have deeper stacks in zone, it's more often that they are like wild and crazy and getting lucky than it is they are um, particularly you know very very strong. Race on table one, Fisher player calls. Gonna bet a little bit for value and probably just check down my hand unimproved. If villain will let me do that, but now that we get to the river, probably go for a very, very small bet, mostly targeting something like a King X type hand. Um, just very unlikely villain has a queen, so just gonna go for a little bit of value. And here on table two, going to go ahead and flat. Um, you know, I flop a gut shot in a double back door. Villain starts by betting a little bit more than a third. He bets like 40% and gets called here. If, uh, you know, this is a spot where I actually think squeezing is not horrible. I, I end up folding there, just like, mm, I'm, I'm really not sure. I think against the small sizing multi-way on a board that is like somewhat draw heavy, I think, you know, it's, it's hard to tell exactly how much fold equity I'm going to have. Looking back uh, at what villain did have on the flop, he had the king of hearts, queen of spades, which I could see from, you know, 24 hours after you play hands on Bovada, they tell you the hands that you, of your opponents. So, you know, to prevent like collusion and, you know, make sure that everything looks on the up and up. So not to be results oriented, but again, that fold ended up being correct on uh, table two. Just going to start with a check. Uh, villain bets on the slightly larger side here. Um, although, you know, off, often on ace high flops, villain should be, you know, picking, you know, like over better check. But, you know, he bets this kind of like middling size. I have blockers to ace 10, ace nine and, and diamonds. Just go ahead and put in a check raise check calling also is you know completely fine there but particularly when i'm under the gun i'm just going to have a lot of you know value dominating hands on uh, on ace queen x and so i don't think that villain should be you know liberally stabbing there and if he is that sizing doesn't seem to make too much sense to me uh, and and more so it's, it's just an indication that my villain is not an experienced player he flatted me under the gun plus one he's just very likely to be stabby uh here with aces obviously get a three bet hopefully we get some Backhand smoke. Get called by aces. Flop comes really good. Going to start with a small bet, somewhere between a quarter and a third. Hope to get some action. Particularly on this flop, you know, like really, really good because villain can't have too many two pairs. He might not have pocket threes. You know, so really he only has like pocket nines. Sometimes like king nine suited if he's not great. Uh, villain bets really small in the turn. I end up just calling here. Not, not too much reason for me to put the, the money in. Uh, and now that he checks to me on the river, I'm gonna jam. Sometimes I run into nines, but it's just so unlikely villain has like queen jack. It's just likely he has like, I don't know, king queen, king jack, stuff like that. Uh, it's just hard to think of what kind of nutted hands that he would check raise, bet small on the turn and then give up by the river. You're definitely gonna open up nine ten suited with a weaker player in the blinds. Whenever I see that either the small blind or the big blind is short stacked, I'll be coming for them, you know, pretty aggressively. Here on table two with depth, uh, I defend a implied odds hands. Flop comes ace high, just gonna start, you know, by checking on the turn. I think villain often has quite a bit of showdown value when he three bets and then checks this flop. So I'm gonna go let it go, check, check. And if he bets, probably just gonna give up my hand. And now that it's checked down to the river, seems to be villain, you know, is gonna have a lot of difficulty finding a 10. So I'm just gonna go ahead and bet, hopefully get him off like, you know, a Jack X type hand, which is what I kind of think he has, but it's kind of weird because if he's a Jack X type hand, he should have like Jack 10 or like two pair. So yeah, don't, don't really know what villain can have there when he checks. Maybe he just has like, I don't know, a bad ace, but I imagine even a bad ace would go check call, check call, and then, um, I'm sorry, check back, check back, and then call, call the river facing a reasonable sizing. Hard to tell what villains have, but you know, if they're playing, if they're playing this badly, then it definitely means that my call pre-flop with 8-7 was correct. Here on table two, I assume Villain is a weaker player because of his stack size, which again seems a little nonsensical, but I've often found it to be true. I see guys with like full stacks, they just are, they're very gambly, right? Like it's just, it's just much more likely that you will run up a stack playing lots of hands than it is playing, you know, very few hands. But if you play lots of hands, obviously, then you're probably not uh, the best player in the world. Here on table one, I imagine this is just a very standard um, four bet. Depending on what the exact uh, rig structure is, this often can be a call as well, right? Ace five, um, 
suited, especially if you're like 150 big blinds deep, it's not the, the end of the world to call, but for a bit. Gets the job done, just again, always erring uh, on these stakes on keeping my foot on the gas, right? I really think that's the, you know, kind of critical. Uh, on table two, I, I fold ace nine off suit, which, you know, on the surface is totally fine. But again, the big blind seems to be on the weaker side, so I really should err on opening those hands. Um, I don't remember when I recorded this, but it must have been like a Friday or Saturday night, because again, as you can see, the games are absolutely wild. This is, you know, it's really hard to see the difference sometimes between, between 200 no limit and 25 no limit. I mean, games look virtually the same, right? Not full stacks, a lot of limpers, some guys with huge stacks who are just like really splashing around. Very often 200 no limit is the limit that players want to come to when they transition from uh, playing live because, you know, it's the it's the game they're used to playing live, 1-2, obviously. Um, and so when they come online, they're like, ah, you know, I'm used to playing $200, $500 buying games. Well, now 25 cent, 50 cent, even a dollar games just don't seem big enough. So I need to start by playing 1-2, maybe some 2-5. And so there's always going to be an influx of recreational players because these are the stakes that mirror the other limits. You're on table one... I I mean, the suited versions of these hands obviously would always defend. This is, you know, this is quite close against that sizing. That's probably not a horrible check raise from an exploitative perspective because people generally overfold when they bet small and then we raise them with pretty good blockers, but I ended up just folding. Here, 910, I imagine because of the big blind, there's always going to be a raise, even though this is obviously a very speculative preflop hand. But being able to slip in those extra V pips against the weaker players is just, I mean, it adds such an absurd amount to your win rate, right? If, if playing with good players all the time is just, is the, obviously the worst thing, it's really detrimental to your win rate, causes, you know, just you to get into like break wars and everyone loses money, then, you know, prioritizing not only sitting at the table, but actually playing hands with the weaker players is of absolute paramount importance um, and, and it's one of the most common leaks I see of players especially when they're very like chart driven and they don't really want to kind of freestyle and they want to have like the you know like really really good uh, guardrails um, but it, it's really really key to branch out on table one flop a set which which I, I'm happy with uh, and on uh, I'm sorry table two I flop a set on table one I raised kings and villain just pots the flop he's probably a, a weaker player I, I'm just gonna give it to him there um, I think that villains sometimes pick, you know, like that pot sizing with air, but I think that when they just do that on an ace high flop, they often have it. Here on table two, uh, this is just an absolute horrible position. Villain polarized on the flop and then raises the river here. Yeah, I mean, when he raises to that sizing, it seems to be, it seems to be that he has got a flush. Usually I'm thinking he has a low flush, like kind of like 6-5. Uh, I end up making a, a tight fold. And we actually see from the hand history afterwards that Villain had King-Queen with the King of Hearts and raised it 4x just thinking his, you know, his hand was good. So essentially he just turned his hand into a bluff there because, you know, like, obviously he got me to fold a better hand. Um, so I, I don't know how I feel about, feel about that. I think, again, you know, he polarized, multi-way, ace-high flop, I'm the under-the-gun player. I think he's just overplaying his hand and I was giving him a little bit too much credit. Here on table one, uh, you know, this hand, when I have a pair between the seven and the five, often going to be a check uh, against full-stacked opponents, but my opponent is just weak here, so I end up um, going ahead and just uh, peeling and then folding. Here, he, uh, here, when we look back at the hands, Phil actually has pocket tens here, so good fold with my sixes. It's, you know, this is one of the best things about playing Ignition is that afterwards you can see what your opponents have and you can see how you did. You can kind of get an, a, an idea of, you know, how, how well did I interpret the meta, right? And you can see, oh, if my players are playing really, really wild, you know, maybe I shouldn't be folding eights to that river raise despite the board being extraordinarily scary. I still think my raise is completely fine, especially from an exploitative perspective. I think that you'll be seeing a flush there the overwhelming majority of the time. And it should also be really, really hard for a villain to find bluffs there. Because, you know, like he bet the large sizing three ways, monotone flop, I ended up calling a flop, you know, when he's raising there. Ah, 
It's really, really hard to see what worse hands I call with. If you can't tell, that hand haunts me. <laughs> Absolutely haunts me. Feel feel like I got owned. I mean, obviously the you know, the <laughs> the solution to that would have been to have more confidence in my hand and bet larger on the river, and then it would have made my you know river fold a little bit easier. But obviously, we don't pick our bet sizings to make our own life easier. We pick bet sizings to make our opponent's life more difficult. Big slick. Hopefully the 500 opens and we get a 3-bet him. Play some big pots with the, the big boys? No. Okay, well, there's still a 900 stack here. I mean, everyone at this table is pretty deep stacked. Love to see it. And everyone folds. <laughs> Such is life. Uh, here, ace-queen. 4-bets a tiny amount of the time, but it's not with these suits in my internal randomization schema. Normally, I 4-bet based on if the high card is on the left or on the right, if it's just a 50-50 mix. And if I'm going to be doing any more mixing, I'm often going to prefer when there is a suit of some sort. So here on table two, notice that when both players are full stacked, I'm just opening a 2.5, right? So I'm never changing my raise size based on the strength of my hand, uh, you know, except for like really, really exceptional circumstances. I'm mostly just um, changing my sizes based on everyone else's stack size. And, and just trying to pinpoint what is the, you know, the, the pain threshold of my opponents. There, I fold ace-8 offsuit under the gun plus one. Again, this was probably a little bit too speedy because the small blind was weak. And so I'm still finding, you know, a little bit too much autopiloting uh, in, my, in my zone game. Uh, here, I imagine I min-raise. Yep, there we go. So, as we can see, just, you know, picking sizings that allow my opponent to keep playing with me. I immediately snap check back on table two on a board this, that is this dry because I think that my opponent will be able to find uh, some bluffs into me. He ends up overbetting. River is, you know, obviously very, very good, so I'm just going to bet really, really small. Um, I'm a little bit worried that he overbets. Sometimes he has, like, quads or something. Unfortunately, he indeed has the ace eight. And, you know, pretty hard to pay... Pretty hard not to pay him off when he only has, whatever, 30, 35 big blinds. Maybe this is one of my biggest leaks, is that when people do not have full stacks, I pay them off a little bit too lightly. But again, that was a, you know, a double-paired board. I have top full house, or well, I have second best full house. Pretty hard to find too many folds there. Uh, and there, on table two, raised a hand that was a little bit on the loose side to target the small blind. He called and just checked folded the flop. And this is really where the money comes from, right? Just picking up the extra two, three big blinds, you know, one or two pots per hundred, and that adds to a tremendous amount to your win rate. So really squeezing out every um, every dime from, you know, the, the positional advantage, location of the fish at the table, really, really important. Hooks on table one, targeting the weaker big blind. Definitely gonna start with a call from Jax, although when, when it goes from 2.2 to 13.3, this is a little bit scary. I, it's almost to the point where you can just fold this pre, because I assume that this is some kind of ridiculous tell from villain. Um, but, you know, I, I end up peeling. Flop comes, ah, a little bit mediocre, and villain just bets half pot. I actually just end up folding there, again, because of the pre-flop sizing. I think villain is just actually going to be a, a little bit on the nutted end. Uh, King 9... Probably a mix between call and four bet. This is a hand that's you know pretty close, and any time that you have a hand that's pretty close, it's probably fine. Flop comes monotone. Uh, you know, monotone and middling a board where villain can definitely start with like a small bet sometimes. You can bet like two, three big blinds, you can start with a check. He checks, and I have a hand that really wants to just kind of get to showdown, so I start with a check as well. Uh, here when villain bets. On the on the small side, not exactly a third. Uh, my hand should still be peeling here. You know, villain obviously can have you know uh, infinite bluffs here, so it's important that I just don't fold, especially when you know I'm somewhere you know near the higher end of my range facing that bet. I definitely have to be in the top like seventy percent of my range there. So yes. uh, here, gonna obviously defend with Ace Nine. I'm thinking about re-raising, mostly because when. I've personally found when villains min-raise you in this spot, they're just not very good. So, end up just starting to, you know, fire off and take the betting lead here. And just kind of go from there. 
Start with betting a quarter, uh, a little, you know, a third. Pretty standard here. I imagine very often, you know, I'm, I'm gonna have a slightly polarized range here. Checking here is, you know, occasionally is not not horrible. You'll find that very often, big blind versus small blind, the flops that have a lot of checks are going to be these double Broadway boards, mostly because after your opponent defends pre-flop from the small blind, I mean, what does he have? He's got like a, a lot of middling pairs. He's got a lot of like queen 10, jack 10, king 10, etc., etc. in the suited variety, the offsuit variety is four bet. And so, you know, king 10, queen 10, jack 9 flops, they're going to have a lot of interactivity with those, those boards. Um, not really anything I can do on table two. Obviously, I think about sizing down to eight, but you know, when villain makes it 3.0, point, uh, he's starting on a 20 stack. I mean, like, you know, how often is it going to be a big difference if I make it eight or if I make it nine? So here we can see, you know, villains are definitely on the weak end uh, and just putting in, you know, king 10 suited. Table one, I see bet small, fold with only one back door. Uh, if I had the backdoor suits, I would also often call as well. But very often when the board is like, you know, club, spade, diamond on your opponent check raises, the first category of hands that you want to fold are hearts, right? The mismatching um, suit to the board. Just going to flat king, queen off suit. Can definitely three bet a small amount of the time. A little bit small. Um, you can call here, you can put in, you know, a small raise, I imagine, with this hand to some small frequency. Something I've been kind of doing is making sure that I'm not always just taking the majority uh, action here and occasionally just mixing up these hands where I know that it's not always as solver favored, but the EV between, you know, betting or checking, betting and raising is going to be, you know, very, very close. And I think that uh, the more often I can take these very neutral EV lines, but put my opponent into spots that they possibly are unfamiliar with, the, the better, right? So I feel like when it comes to freestyling, I'm often going to be slightly better than my opponents, and so I like to take them into territory where neither of us are that studied. And, you know, and the truthfully very often is, in a lot of these spots, I'm slightly more studied than my opponents. Uh, here, Jack 4, it's going to be a mix with... No clubs and no diamonds. If I had clubs or diamonds, probably bet a little bit more. Ah, I mean, this hand probably always mixes. Start check calling the flop. Villain check, snap checks the turn. And uh, when the river comes in ace, uh, I mean, villain should not be too ace heavy, mostly because a lot of those are going to check back on the turn. But here I just put in a large bet. There's busted clubs. Villain does not have too many jacks himself. So just put in that bet. Might be a little bit inaccurate because the double back door, um, or I'm sorry, the back door diamonds came in. Uh, but I think that Dylan's often going to follow through with the back door diamonds. In fact, the back door diamonds actually should be betting more often than the front door. I'm sorry, the back door draw should be betting more often than the front door flush draw. So here on table two, see this commonly recurring theme where I'm going to be raising on the looser side when the small blind is not full stacked, even though, you know, 8-7 suited is definitely a little bit standard here. I'd probably still open a hand like maybe 7-5 suited, maybe 6-4 suited. Again, just trying to always get in the way of the weaker player. And now, obviously, with a little bit of depth, this hand's probably going to have to call, especially when Villain makes it so, so small pre-flop. Completely with. Don't have the connection to the 10. If I had, like, you know, something like 9-8 or Jack-9, this would be a better float or raise, but just going to end up folding that hand. Again, looking to fold... Uh, hand classes that contain the the suit that whiffs the board most often, right? Always the first on the chopping block facing raises. Even facing the small raises, usually if I'm going to fold junk, it's going to be the, you know, the junk without the back doors first. That's always the, the first thing. Here, Jack-10, very, very standard defense. Flop very well for our hand, pretty bad. Um, I mean, like, our hand flops well, but this is a, a board that's going to really, really smash villain. So he checks, I check. I don't like how fast I check. Um, I think it kind of gives away that I have a little bit of a middling hand here. Although, I mean, if I had a very strong hand, I'd, I'd often bet the flop. Well, it checks me twice. Uh, it's pretty close. I can I can check again, and kind of induced by the river. I ended up going for just kind of a small valley bet with the intention of, you know, I mean, sometimes I can bet, I can bet the river. Dep really depends on 
what my uh, opponent does there and how fast he does it. I think if he snap calls the turn, I'm going to always value bet the river. And when he, like, tank calls, eh, I probably still value bet the river, actually. We raise ace jack on table two. Flop comes obviously very good for us. Going to start with a small bet as a default. I don't know why I choose betting a third instead of a quarter here. Yeah, I'm just clicking buttons. The EV obviously between these hands is very, very, very similar. I don't know why I check. Hmm. That's eh, kind of strange, but sometimes I'm just going to mix it up. And I go for the raise there against this sizing. Yeah, I like it. I think that sizing and that speed is not indicative of a particularly strong hand. And also against weaker players, they stab you know very, very often. So checking back with the intention of raising. Oh, that's actually probably what I was doing. I was just taking note of the fact that, you know, non-full stack players probably are just way too stabby on turns, especially on like king high and ace high turns, or, or a king high or ace high flops, where very often they should be playing, you know, um, large bet or check, facing a check back. Here on table one, and starting with a flop check, I'm gonna check the turn and go for some river value. Often the pairs between you know, uh, you know, top pair and and bottom and second pair are going to be candidates to check when you play mixed strategy on the flop. Although, just you know, simplifying to a small bet on the flop, probably not horrible on that spot either. Um, usually, when you're under the gun, if you can't have threes, you know, on boards that have threes and twos, they're not going to be boards that you want to open as often. And and, and uh, inversely, those are going to be boards where villain is going to often want to dunk into you. Uh, defend ace eight and flop double back doors. So this hand's usually going to be a float or a raise. Looks like I'm kind of thinking about it here. Okay, so I end up just calling here. Turn is a mixed blessing. Obviously improves the spades, but does not improve. Uh, or and, oh, I'm sorry, improves spades and also gives me the open and straight draw. But after villain overbets on a turn that brings in. So much coordination. Definitely a spot where he's not really allowed to overbet because it's going to be a, a nuts changing turn that I can hit. Uh, it's probably going to be a huge tell. If you're if you're interested in more information on coaching, staking, how you can beat these mid stakes games because they are super super soft, please hit me up over at overnightmonster.com. I'll talk to you soon.